So this is week four. This is week four of our meeting uh, together in our study series entitled Swift Transitions, uh, Anticipating, Welcoming, and Celebrating the Moves of God. And um, as we have shared over the last uh, three weeks, um, one of the things that we aim to do with this series is to ensure that we, the people of God, believers in Christ, members of Work for Life Church, are able to uh, come out of this time together on a weekly basis and then uh, at the end of our study series, uh, we can come out of this time um, comfortable with the idea that that various change events will come, different uh, stages in life will come upon us, and we're going to be okay uh, because we know first that they're coming, and two, we recognize that when these change events happen, these give us opportunities to see God afresh, to hear God all over again, and perhaps to get to know God in ways that we have not known the Lord before because we've not in, been in positions uh, such as the ones that are upon us. And so we anticipate these changes, we welcome these changes, and then as we make the process, the change comes, now we enter into the period of transition where we get the blessing of being able to uh, discern, to determine, to be prayerful about, to even sometimes be unsure about the direction that God is calling us to go. And yet we go faithfully and we do so with joy because we know that God is in the change. God will walk us through the transition. And then when we come out of the period of transition, God will continue to be there and we will be better because of it. And so uh, that's the aim for this series together. And I thank you for continuing to join us uh, in this way. For those of you who are joining um, uh, by way of YouTube uh, on the recording, um, thank you for uh, continuing to log in. If you haven't had an opportunity to review the previous three sessions, I do want to commend those to you. You may find them. Uh, on the Word for Life Church Ministries YouTube channel. So if you go there, uh, you'll see the list of recordings and uh, Swift Transitions. You'll see sessions one, two, and three are loaded for your view, your viewing pleasure and uh, for your prayerful consideration. And so uh, again, these handouts that we're going to be talking through are located on the church website at wordforlifechurch.org. When you're there, look for uh, the resources tab and you'll see Bible study and then you can uh, click on that and then you'll find the uh, handouts there on the church website. Uh, again, thank you for being with us today. As we uh, make our way through the handouts, I'm going to prepare us in advance so that you know I'm going to be asking for a series of readers today. We have before us a uh, rather extended passage of, of text to read. Um, certainly in the time that we have, we uh, generally don't, don't take this long a passage, but I think it's helpful to be able to, to take all of this together at one time, uh, given the theme of our, our lesson today. So if you don't have your Bibles with you, please go and grab them or you, if you're not working on your, your device where you can access your Bible, access your Bible on your device now, if you will, um, that would be wonderful. Uh, today we are going to explore the text of, of John chapter 9. John chapter 9, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 34 of John chapter 9. John chapter 9, verse 1 through 34. All right. So we'll, we'll get there in a few moments. Before we get there, of course, we want to kind of level set a little bit, to ensure that we're all kind of pulling together uh, in the same direction. So um, you'll see on the top of the handout uh, a bit of an introduction, if you will, just to make sure that we are uh, on the same page again. Uh, this week, we're talking about physical and social identity transitions. Physical and social identity transitions. I believe this is uh, before us today, uh, in part because we generally don't receive the text that we're going to talk about today um, in a literal sense, um, which is to say 
that we experience some real physical transitions in life. And sometimes these real physical transitions have a way of also then impacting our social standing or status or identity. These two things often um, are spoken of or kind of an around the way uh, um, uh, kind of learning or education, if you will, or conversation. Um, but I don't, I'm not sure that we spend um, a, enough time talking about these very relevant life issues, which is to say that we change. Physically, we change, and socially, we change. And sometimes, as I mentioned, these physical and social changes come together. And when they happen, again, with change is the event, there's a, a certain event that takes place. Sometimes it's the fact that you turn 30 years old and then your body starts to do different things. Uh, sometimes it's the fact that, you know, you've had uh, some sort of accident and your body begins to operate in a different kind of way. So there are things that happen to us. There are changes. And then the, the step after that becomes the transition. How then do we handle the change? The physical nature of the change and the social nature of the change have a lot to do with one another. Uh, more often than not, the physical change is going to impact us as individuals, whereas the social change can have far-reaching implications. While it does certainly impact us on a social level, these physical changes, these social changes that come with them uh, reach beyond us as individuals. And how we process these transitions is a matter of, of how we view them and what we intend to do about them. Okay, How do you view the change or the transition? And then what do you intend to do about it? So part of anticipating, welcoming, and, and celebrating how God moves throughout our lives is to appreciate that God can use physical and social transitions to bless us and to be glorified by us. And if I had to kind of drop anchor somewhere uh, in a, a lesson to say that this is what I'm talking about, that's what I'm talking about. All right. So, uh, again, it's our task is to learn how to appreciate that God can use physical and social transitions to bless us and be glorified by us. OK, can can be somewhat a daunting proposition to make or claim or argument to make. But I think the text we're going to see today uh, can help us in that way. Two areas of concern. First, physical identity, and then second, social identity. Physical identity. Um, these are the distinguishing traits that describe us or in some ways may even define us, right? These are the distinguishing traits of an individual. And when I, often, these are things that can be beyond our control, and yet, they are things that are subject to our desires and our resources. What do I mean by that? Well, if I was born with black hair, that's beyond my control. But if I decide later in life that I want to uh, change my hair color, that's a subject to my desire and my resources to make it happen. You understand what I'm saying? So it's in my it's out of my control what that characteristic is but it's in my control perhaps to do something in light of how i view that characteristic okay so again they can be out of our control and sometimes they are subject to our desires to our resources and often um, physical identity is determined by what can be seen by other people, okay? 
what can be seen by other people. So that's kind of what I'm aiming at as far as physical identity. Okay. Social identity. Social identity is the relation that's established by some sort of psychological identification. Um, the word, and what I mean by that is that word uh, identity uh, uh, implies a secondary implication is that it implies sameness or uniformity, if you will, or a belonging, a sense of belonging, sameness. So this is especially so when one's individuality is constructed by virtue of that one's relationship with or to other people. Okay, so social identity, you you gain your social identi identity by virtue of the fact that you hang around certain types of folks. You know, the old saying, birds of a feather flock together, right? That, your, that can be your social identity. So if you hang around with the smartest kids in the class, or if you hang around with the uh, wealthiest people on the block, you begin to identify with them or at least be identified with them, right? The alternate is true if you hang out with the class clown, or if you hang out with the ones that have a hard time managing money well, you you become identified with them too, right? So there's a certain sameness attached to this, this notion of social identity. And I'm being very restrictive here, uh, probably for sake of time, but there's a lot of points uh, in our lives where we um, attach ourselves to certain people and then we detach ourselves from certain people. Sometimes it's because we recognize this, this, re this fact, if you will, of social identity. Because social identity also has much to do with how you see yourself as a part of the whole. Okay, so physical identity, again, more often than not, these are going to be the, the traits, the characteristics, if you will, that can be seen by other people. You may or may not have control over those traits, depending on where you are in life, the various resources you have, your desires and all of that. How do you want to look? How do you want to appear? Right. Social identity is generally how you see yourself. Okay within the context of relationship with other people. All right, are we good there? Any questions about that so far? We'll make sure we got that covered before we go further. All right, yeah. so the question then becomes, what happens when the way you could be identified has changed? In other words, you were one way two years ago, and today that identification has changed. Again, it could be a physical identification. It could be a social identification. What happens when that changes? Can I have somebody to read the next part of the handout, please? You can unmute yourself, if you will, and read the paragraph that starts with physical identity. I'll take you past. Physical identity. Uh, the first one, right? Under the opening yes. paragraph. Where I just let, yes, where I just left off, off bullet physical identity. Yes. Okay. Physical identity, the distinguishing traits of an individual. Not that one. Okay. Not that one. All right. Gotcha. <laughs> physical identity includes height, hair color, or style, skin tone among other obvious personal markers. If you are reading this, then you know that the way someone described you, described you 20 years ago was different than they might describe you today. This point, this points to the reality that physical transitions can change how people are identified. Mm -hmm. Questions for our consideration. Again, just want to take a couple of moments. You might do this one rather quickly, 
or you might need some extra time. And if you do need some extra time, please feel free to take it after our time has ended today. First question is this, how has your physical identity changed over the years? Just go ahead and write on those lines available there. How has your physical identity changed over the years? So that's as you're faster. writing. I'm sorry. Oh, I, you want me to answer that one? Uh, no, just go ahead and write it down. I already did. All right. Uh, again, if you need extra time, I invite you to take that time at the end of our study. But please do uh, take the time to go through these questions. I think they'll help you. The second question, how have changes to your physical identity caused you to change? Similar type of question, but now I want to know how you reacted to the change. And again, you can take your time and write your responses down on that uh, question. The second question, in large part, begins to help us note how we process change. In other words, as it relates to physical transitions, that second question will help us to get down the road of transitioning based on our physical identity. So the fact of your changes physically has created the reality of your transition based on that physical change. Okay. And we're going somewhere with this. I pray you will stay with us. So that's physical identity. Next, if I can ask somebody else to read the section that begins with social identity. I can read faster. Right. Social identity. Who do you spend most of your time with? How do you spend your leisure time? Are you energized by large groups or by private time? What informs your decisions about with whom and how you spend your time? What group or groups of people do you identify with? Access to these and other questions can inform our understanding of social identity. All right, thank you. All right, again, two questions, fairly similar to the questions about physical identity. First question, how has your social identity changed over the years? To help you answer that question, um, you can kind of look at some of the leading questions that you just heard Deacon Smalling read off. All right. How has your social identity changed? How has your social identity changed? It's okay to be honest here. We're not grading papers. I'm not going to ask you to read anything out loud. Just make a note of it. Let's see. Let's see what you come up with. The second question. How would you describe the common bonds of your social circle? What are some of the characteristics of your social network, if you will? Your circle of friends, the people you hang around with. And they can be related to you. They might be living in your house. They may live elsewhere. There may be people live across the country. There may be people that live upstairs. How would you describe the bonds that hold that social circle together? And there must be at least one or two things. Otherwise, the circle would be broken, right? So there's something that binds people together in social groups in such a way that that group begins to develop an identity 
and you take it on by virtue of the fact that you are in that group, or that you hang out with those folks, right? The uh, the bond, the common bonds, the things that bind you together, they can be things that you would describe as positive. You might recognize there's some areas of concern or growth is necessary. So you might say there's some things in there that may be kind of negative. You know, that's okay too. Just the, the point is just to name them and then let's see where you are. Let's see where you are. I told you we're going somewhere with this. This is certainly an individual exercise where uh, each person who is uh, consuming this, this learning session with us is, I pray, able to get a hold of these two identities, the physical identity, the social identity, respond to the questions that have been asked, to see yourself in them, but then to also, as I noted in the beginning, recognize that your individual physical identity and the social group that you belong to have a way of not only influencing and impacting how other people see you, but how you see yourself. And then you bring all of that of who you are and help us to be Word for Life Church Ministries. So as you change physically, there are some things inherent in that change that will cause us to transition. As you change socially, there are some things inherent in that change that will cause us to transition. And now I don't say that to make a judgment. I just say that to help us to appreciate that even the what we might consider the personal small matters of life that we think have nothing to do with other people sometimes have just about everything to do with other people, right? Because you help us to be who we are. And in some ways I would, I would pray that we help you to be who you are, right? Now we have to recognize that in this mutuality of transitions that's taken place, you and me, and, and the neighbor that you sit next to in church on Sunday, the brother that you maybe haven't heard from in a while, but still remains a part of our fellowship, right? Uh, we all have a way of impacting one another, right? So how you view yourself has direct impact on us, because in some ways, how you view yourself helps us to see you. The groups that you hang around with, they have a way of informing your lifestyle and way of being and expectations and even your ways of worship. And you bring that into the Word for Life Church Ministries Fellowship, and that impacts who we are. Right. And again, I don't I don't make a claim for positive or negative impact here. I just make a claim for the fact that there is impact. And as you change those change events that occur the way you process the change, the transition that takes place with you also then helps us to be who we are, right? This is both, uh, I think it can be an encouraging and welcoming statement because we intend to be invitational so that each individual can, can make the mark that God has given you to make can impact us with your giftedness, your presence, your personality, all of that. So this, this can be greeted um, in a very positive way. And for some, this might be greeted in a very kind of anxious way because we don't want to have that much say <laughs> on how other people do things, come to church, worship, give, uh, fellowship with people talk to folks, right? Serve in ministry. We, we don't want to have that much influence or impact, but the reality is the very instant you become a part of the social circle, uh, even in the social circle, the social circle that we call church, 
in that moment, our identity changes so that we can, in some ways, incorporate you. Here's the rub. Here's the rub. There are instances, more often than not, I would probably suggest, where the institution, the social group, has an identity that is stubborn to change, that resists the notion of transition. And I think in large part that can happen when the individuals who make up that social circle, that social identity, the identity even of the church, resist in some ways what God might be attempting to do with that group. And that, that's the rub. That's, that can be the danger where we know who we are individually and we know who the group has historically been. And we let that keep us from exploring the opportunities that God has given us, especially in the way of open doors for transitioning into the future God has prepared. This is one of the um, cautions that we want to uh, note. So even as you complete that first page of the handout, I want us to also be looking at some of this as we turn our attention to the text, to John chapter 9, verse 1 through 34. Before we get there, however, um, again, I'm going to ask some folks, you all just be prepared to read, and then if you can... Uh, let's let's do this together so it's not just Deacon Murphy and Deacon Smalling doing the reading. Um, there are other people who can do the reading with us as well. So I'm going to invite everybody to do some reading in a moment. Um, but before we do that, I want to just prepare you for that. So before we get there, what questions do you have at this point? Comments, concerns, anything troubling you? Or is there something that you have found reason to celebrate already? What are you thinking? Oh, I'll make a comment, Pastor. Uh, let me see. I, I don't know if I should say it's troubling me, but I I think that I'm one of those people who are kind of uh, uh, stuck in... Uh, stuck in who I, who I am as an individual. And it, it, um, it's not always easy for me to move from that to what everybody else is doing. Uh, I, I think uh, one of the statements I made when you first became our pastor is that I'm not a team player. I'm sure you remember that. Uh, and so... Because I guess I'm used to uh, kind of moving in my own little comfort zone, my own little world. It's it's a little difficult sometimes to come out of that, if that makes any sense. So those last comments that you made about opportunities and all of that, and it and so that would be something I guess I would really have to pray about because. Um, was a conversation I had with someone this morning about at this stage in my life, as I'm dealing with uh, some health issues that I, I I did not have to deal with in the past, that uh, I become even less willing to uh, jump into whatever's going on. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. But I know that's uh, something that I would have to pray about. That whatever God's plan is, whatever his purpose is, is what I, I need to be willing to do. Mm -hmm. Good, good. I, well, thank you for your um, honesty and openness there. I uh, certainly appreciate it. And uh, that the comment that you, you made, uh, you know, it's not one that's unique to you in terms of, uh, and I'll paraphrase it here, I am who I am. Um, you'd be surprised how many people hear that 
in the process of change and change management and transitioning and all of that. Um, I am who I am. And, and that's beautiful. It really is. It, and praise God for the fact that you are who you are. And what I, um, I, I'll i share the other part of the conversation, uh, again, paraphrasing is that, uh, and, and this is for everybody, this is for everybody. The fact that we are who we are does not have to keep God from helping us to be who we can be. Okay, this is not just an individual statement. This is this is a statement intended for the corporate body. The fact that we are who we are today does not have to keep uh, uh help, does not have to prevent God from helping us to be who we can be. So we celebrate the fact that we are who we are. We praise God for that because there's you know there's some history that went into that. There's some hard days, some long nights, some tears, some laughter, some praiseworthy moments, some missteps, some sins, some reconciliations. I praise God for who we are. Amen. And that does not keep us from being who God wants us to be. Uh, and so that's why it, it's always helpful to have an eye on the fact that transitions keep coming. They keep coming. And the moment we give ourselves to the opportunity that God gives, then we can tap into the notion that we can be who God desires for us to be. Anyone else? But you should be, I think you, even though you in your own self, but I think that if God wants to show you a better way, you should be willing to do that. Not just be set in your own way. Amen to that. Amen to that. That's the reality of life that, again, this is the, the idea is the opportunities are coming. And again, we don't know. They may not be what we would describe as a big opportunity. It just may be, you know, God showing us how to use Zoom, right? But before that, we would never want to be on a video call, right? We wouldn't want to FaceTime people. But then the world shut down. And then all we could do was FaceTime folks and be on Zoom. And we had to learn it, right? This opportunity, small opportunity, but to not take the opportunity is to miss out on the blessings of God. And then that one example, but you, you see that happening all over the place. So I thank you for sharing that, DK, because yeah, yeah, it doesn't that doesn't have to keep us from anything unless we let it keep us from something. Amen. Anyone else? Questions, comments? All right. Good. So now what we're going to do is take, uh, we're going to take turns reading here from John chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. We have a little lengthy read, uh, but I think we can get through it together. Um, if someone is willing to get us started, you can start and I'll let you know where I would like for you to end somewhere along the way. Okay. I'll start. Uh, go ahead, Dick and Dixon. I heard you first. Yeah. Okay. And this uh, is um, John 9. Okay. I'm reading from the New Living Version. Jesus heals a man born blind. Verse 1, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It is not because of his sin or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the task assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming and then no one can work. But while I am, while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. All right, thank you, Dick and Dixon for reading that, getting us started. I appreciate that. That's the first five verses of the chapter. And I'm going to ask you on the handout, if as we're reading this, you can make your notes there. We'll come back and kind of pick these up. 
I want you to note the physical and social changes and the transitions that this gentleman who's born blind is going to go through as he encounters Jesus. But I also want you to note that there are some other people who perhaps need to experience physical and social transition. So just pay attention to the how the activity of this text flows. And then together, I think we'll be able to see um, how these transitions can help us as we learn to anticipate, welcome, and celebrate uh, transitions as a part of our own growth process. All right. Thank you again, Deacon Dixon. That was verse one through five of chapter nine. Can we have somebody to pick up at verse six, please? Verse six from the New International Reader's Version. After he said this, he spit on the ground. He made some mud with the spit. Then he put the mud on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of is that Salome. Salome. Salome means scent. So the man went and washed and he came home to see. He, his neighbors and people who had seen him earlier begging, asked questions. Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg, they asked? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he's, he only looks like him. But the man who had been blind kept saying, I am the man. Then, how were you, then how were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to wash, mm -mm. he told me to go to Salome and wash. So I went and washed, then I could see. When the man where is the man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. Thank you, uh, Dean Juliet. Appreciate that. I'll make sure we're all caught up on the action of the text. Just breathe real quick so you know what's happening. All right. Verse 13. We have the next reader. I can read okay. past. All right, thank you. Uh, go ahead, Deacon Akins first, and then Deacon Smalling. I'll catch you next. Gotcha. They brought to the Pharisees him that after a fourth time was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received the sight, his sight. And he said unto them, he put clay upon my eyes and I washed and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others say, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They say unto the blind, they say unto the blind man again, what saith Thou, what saith of thou him that he has opened thine eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. All right. The, thank, thank you, Dick Akins. Appreciate mm -hmm. you. Uh, mm -hmm. Dick Smalling, can you pick up there verse 18? Oh, yes. This is the New King James Version, starting with verse 18. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him. He will speak for himself. 
His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, asked him. All so right, they, thank you. Let's, let's hold there. Let's press pause there. Again, just want to take a quick, deep breath. You follow right. the course of the action. Everybody know what's happening so far, mm -hmm. right? We're good? Okay. Yeah. This is a familiar story, so I just want to make sure we're on the same page. We got a few more verses left. Uh, if we could have um, maybe two other readers, uh, whoever wants to go next, pick up with verse 24, please. I'll take it past. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. Then they said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. All right. Man Thank you right there, Deacon Murphy. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. All right. Do we have another one? A taker for the last four verses, five verses. I can read. All right. The man answered and said to them, why, this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from. Yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that any one opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins. And are you teaching us? And they cast him out. All right. Thank you. That is our group project, our reading of John chapter 9, verse 1 through 34. I appreciate you. Thank you for uh, for sharing that with us from your various translations as well. Um, for the different flavor of the text that we are uh, able to pick up from each one. All right. So this, again, this is, I think, a fairly familiar passage of scripture, uh, this event concerning this man born blind. Um, so uh, I think the summary of it is pretty easy, right? He was born blind. One day he came in touch with Jesus. So Jesus kind of came in touch with him, told the man to go wash in the pool of Siloam. Man went to go wash in the pool of Siloam. He did as he was told and came back seeing. So he's no longer blind. We got that. Mm -hmm. So he's walking around town. People see this man who was previously blind, in fact, blind from birth. And there is some debate about whether or not that was the same person. He says, yep, that was me. Now he goes to the Pharisees. Of course, the Pharisees, he needs to go uh, to the priest to show himself so that he can be declared healed and all that good stuff. So they, they brought the man into the Pharisees. And they got some questions. They got some questions. What happened to you? How did how did you have how how did you uh, how were how are you now able to see? Um, and I love what he says here. Um, I love what he says. He put mud on my eyes. Then I washed, and now I see. It sounds like a pretty straightforward process. He put mud on my eyes. I washed. And now I see, All right? That's verse 15. Of course, from there, you have Pharisees who are already at odds with Jesus. And they say, listen, fella, no, this, this does not happen. This kind of, and they essentially call, call Jesus a diviner or a sinner, uh, one who practices or engages in the in witchcraft, if you will. The first um the first charge is that he's not observing the Sabbath. 
He's not observing the Sabbath. The second charge, uh, according to these Jews who didn't believe, is that the man who was born blind is a liar. So they go to get his parents and they want his parents to make the confession. Let's make sure we get this right because we can't have people believing in this, this character. This guy who puts mud on people's eyes and then causes them to see. So let's go get his parents. And they try to entrap the parents. Parents have nothing to do with it. Uh, and so they say, listen, we don't know. We know he was born blind because we were there with his parents all his life. He'd been blind. We, we know that. But the fact that he's now seeing, we don't know how that happened. But go ask him. That's what they say. They put it back on their son. Go ask him. He's of age. That's verse 23. Now, because they can't catch him up in the lie the first time, they bring him back in the second time. And they say to him, listen, this is what you need to do. Give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. He says, listen, I don't know what y'all are talking about. I can't call him a sinner. Here's what I know. I was blind. Now I see. I want you to see the simplicity of this man's arguments. First, he says, he put mud on my eyes. I washed and now I see. That's that's the explanation for what happened. And then <laughs> when it comes time to describing who Jesus is, this man says, I can't tell you all that stuff. Here's what I know. I was blind and now I see. So it's, it seems to me this this business of getting to know Jesus is a rather simple proposition. Uh, because Jesus it performs certain miracles in our lives that position us so that there is no other answer, no alternative. There's no one, there's no force, there's no science. Sometimes there's no logic even. It's just the fact that Jesus was involved. And that's the change event. So I want you to note that on your on your handouts. If you don't get anything else from this, question about physical and social transitions. Jesus was involved. And that's the change event. Go ahead, mark that down. Jesus was involved. And that's the change event. I do declare that's going to bless somebody's life later on when you get finished writing stuff down and thinking logically about the change in your life. The fact that Jesus got involved with you. And that is the change event. Let's keep going. All right. Tell us again what happened. They said, we know he got involved. We know you've been changed. But now tell us again. We'll see if we can get the story straight. And he says back to them, listen, I, don't, I already told you once. I don't know why you want me to tell you again. Do you wish to be his disciple? <laughs> I love the spunk in this this man. Um, he says, "No, no, listen. We we're disciples of Moses. It's only give us that Jesus discipleship stuff." And then, and then the man he reads them for who they are. He says, "This is really it's amazing. You all claim to be something, but you know nothing." Okay. Um, they say to him, "We know God does not listen to sinners, but He does listen to one who worships Him and obeys His will." Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. And if this man is not from God, he could do nothing. That's the testimony of the man born blind. But now I want you to hear how they refute his or attempt at least to refute his testimony. They answer him and they said, you were born entirely in sins. And you're trying to teach us. And they drove him out. I lifted up this passage of the text. It This goes longer, <laughs> right? Jesus comes back in. He 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 uh, restores or rescues the, rather the man, of course. And Jesus doesn't wish that anybody be driven out such as it were. Uh, but it's the nature of one's physical and social identities that come up in this passage that help, I think, help us as individuals and then helps us as a church to comprehend the blessings that come with both physical and social transition. As I mentioned already, this idea of Jesus's involvement is the center of the activity. 
A lot of times we want to center the activity on the physical nature of what Jesus will do. And we do that rightly, but we do it at peril. Because in centering Jesus's actions, we sometimes miss Jesus. And that's the point that I think this young man, that's not young man, the, the man born blind. I think that's one of the points he's trying to make. I was blind, now I see. That's all I know. And you're trying to tell me something else about him. All I know is this man showed up for me. And he did something for me. He's the change event. And in his presence, there comes the physical change. And it necessitates a social change. I want you to see this. The physical change, I think, is pretty evident. Y'all get the physical change, right? He's born blind. Now he sees. Okay, I think we got that. But now, after the, the the change always precedes the transition, right? We talked about that in week one. So what then becomes a physical transition? What does this man have to do now, physically, to transition, to receive this blessing that he's received? He should become a, a perhaps he, by, by uh, Jesus stepping in there like he did, he probably would become um, not being a sinner. He probably could become not being a sinner, and I'll address that part in a moment. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we'll, I'll take that. Okay. Uh, I think that the man didn't actually know who Jesus was, and so all he knows is he was blind. And now he sees. He also already knows this is a miracle, just that. So in his, he had to recognize that whoever this man was that gave him sight, that this man was more than a man. He had to, he had to recognize he was dealing with a miracle worker and then beyond miracle worker, what kind of miracle worker, um, who he was, how he did what he did, the man didn't know. But right. he knew he had done something that no other man on earth had ever done. And he yeah. couldn't really get the Pharisees to understand what he was telling, telling them. Yeah, yep. So, yes. And in fact, so he does mention that in verse 32. He says, listen, never since the world began has anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. So he, he appreciates the magnitude of this tremendous blessing, this encounter with Jesus. And then uh, further beyond where I asked us to stop, we do get the uh, direct um, note that, yes, you're and you're right to say it. He does not know who Jesus is until Jesus reveals himself to the man. Right. So and, and so, again, that's down the road a little bit. Um, I want to catch us back up, especially with the, respect to the question of sin here, because this notion of sin and being a sinner has come up a couple of times in the 34 verses that we've read. It is presupposed in that day that persons who are born with certain um, physical um, disabilities uh, or disadvantages, sight being one talk or speech being another, uh, uh, certain kind of physical uh, handicaps, if you will, um, are there is something or a reason why they are born in that way is because of the sins of their parents or because they are, they have prepaid the penalty for their sins later in life. Thus, they are born that way before they have an opportunity to sin. It is kind of the, the folks who believe in that, saying that God has punished you in advance for what you're going to do, right? Because somebody had to have done something wrong. That's the notion of sin in this text. Um, it is a driving motivation for the understanding of the Pharisees. But it is not at this point a driving motivation for Jesus and the way that 
he says God is going to be glorified. Okay. So I want us to appreciate that, that often we have these physical changes, these physical, um, if you will, disadvantages or disabilities that folks will assign to something. But inherent in this is the notion of God getting glory. God getting glory. I, you know, you can see online, you know, um, examples of, of persons. And now I'm thinking of, of a young lady. She can't be any more than a teenager. I, I doubt she's even a teenager by now. That She's blind um, and she she has a bit of sight so she can see a little bit. Uh, but she uses um, uh, guides to walk with um, and speaks very intelligently and articulately and is and and I guess her she has this social media channel where she is quoting scriptures and providing inspirational talks, if you will, and even praying. And, and and perhaps you might see that and receive this example of this young girl, blind as she is, uh, physically uh, disabled as she is or handicapped and still able to glorify God in the way that she knows how to do it. So that her physical, uh, her physical reality does not have to limit what God is doing and can do with and through her. Okay, but now in the case of this young man in the in the text, uh, I keep calling him a young man. We don't know how young he is. We know he's old enough. His mother says, or his parents say, he's old enough. Um, what we know about him is that Jesus does not point to the notion of his sin as a precondition for his healing. Jesus simply heals him. And it is the healing that sparks the conversation about physical transition because for him to be in the process of transitioning physically, he has got to move from where he is show himself physically around town, be subject to what other people are saying about his physical appearance and whether or not it's even possible. And then somehow be able to assign the reality of his new physical state to God's glory. Yes. Physical transitioning, it's happening, yes. And the example you used with the young lady was her transition um, immediate. And the reason I say that is because in the scripture, there was not, that was an immediate um, change. He, he went from being blind one minute and being able to see the next minute if there's a time issue, I, I didn't recognize that. But I think that the the fact that his transition was immediate, I think that's important because Jesus didn't say there's a reason why um, it's going to take you six months to get well and somebody else immediate. So I don't know that that uh, immediacy is is um, a concern in the process of the of the change event, because we know that Jesus has performed other miracles and uh, other uh, from blind to sight miracles where he had to do the healing over again a second time um, and told the man who he healed in that instance to go wash his eyes seven times. So sometimes the healing can be immediate. And, you know, that has some something to do with, you know, what I think we want to say about it. But it, that's not necessarily going to be um, an indicator of, of what uh, uh, of a main kind of idea to pursue. All right. So not not in this particular case. 
because um, again, no, the, the notion of transition, I'll get you in a minute. The notion of transition is not always an instant thing. It's something that can happen and take place over time. Wow, yes. that's, that's true. But if you look at, G at Christ, at Jesus Christ's healing, almost all of them are immediate. The, I mean, when you look at um, the man that his friends let down through the ceiling, his healing mm -hmm. was immediate. The man that right. put a wall. Why get him in the presence of Jesus? Yeah, well, right. We're all recognizing this. this Jesus is Jesus was the change agent. And um, with the people that died, and he brought back to life the, the young lady and, and what the girl's brother's name, Lazarus. All of that happened, it seemed to me, unless there was a time difference, and I missed it, that all of what he did was immediate. When it came in most to cases, miracles. Yes, in most cases, that's that's true. That's that's true, but there are still other, at least the one instance that I've just mentioned, where, you know, the, the appeal to immediacy is is not the same. You can't make that same appeal. So I guess the question becomes, what is what is the point, or what is the um, the lesson to be learned, or the principle to be taken away from the moments when there is immediate healing versus um, process healing for lack of a, a term okay so and you know i that, that'll take us down the road another path for today but you know the point is that there's a healing that takes place and whether or not the process for transition takes place over time or it happens right away the point is the change event has happened and then what do you do with the change that's the bigger point at work here Pastor? Yes. I wanted to say um, in the, the first part of it, he was actually changing the way the disciples thought anyhow. He was renewing their mind because, it, you know, they were going along with their pre-programming way of thinking. Because first of all, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If God only hears sinners, that's everybody. You know, so I, I see him making disciples. I see him changing their way of thinking. Yes. And you have helped us to make our transition from the physical to the social. Because what you have rightly discerned here, uh, Reverend Bias, is that first it's the disciples who have raised this idea of a social construct based on sin and who can belong versus who cannot. And the belonging and the not belonging is situated along the lines of sin, but the, also the physical uh, evidence of his blindedness. So I want you to see the connection between this physical, this, this man's physical state and his social state. And the disciples tell us what the social state is, don't they? That's what the rabbis just said. They said, well, listen, Jesus, here's a man, he's, he's born blind. Who did the sinning? Somehow or other, they have situated themselves other than or apart from him. As if to say he's somebody different than us. Right? So then Jesus points to the transition that needs to take place in a social sense. Right there in verse three of the text, Jesus answers and says, this, neither this man nor his parents uh, sinned in order to cause his blindness, because you're right, all have sinned and all have come short of the glory. So that's not why he was born blind. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. That's why he was born blind, so that God could work through him. Note the social transition that has to take place. If you are a disciple of Christ and your, pre, your presupposition is that he's a sinner, 
because that's what tradition, history, the lessons we learned growing up on mama's knee, the stories we were told on the schoolyard, all that's what they that's how we learned this. And then here comes Jesus to say, well, unlearn it because <laughs> God is going to work through him. They construct this social, uh, they have socialized, they try to socialize him out of the equation based on some sin and his physical condition. And Jesus is saying, don't throw him out. He's the one God's about to work through. Okay, so first it's the disciples who uh, approach this notion of what it means to be involved in social transitions because now if he's not a sinner and if his parents are not sinners based on his condition now they can be accepted now they are people that we can walk with now they become like us who believe we have not sinned because we were not born blind like him you know get it this notion of identity appeals to sameness, to uniformity. And if we can say he's like us, or if we can say that he, that we are like him, now we can get our social reality together, right? We can, we can, we can walk together. But there's his disciples who bump into this idea of social transition, but then there's also the neighbors. Right. Verse eight, the neighbors and everybody else who has seen him begging before social transition again, social transition based on the physical. They saw him before begging. And now he's able to earn a living for himself, maybe. Because now he can see. Before he was a beggar, we would, wouldn't have anything to do with him. We would maybe give him a little something and send him on his way. But now, now, if it's the same guy, he, you know, he's one of us. That's our homeboy. Right? Maybe now we can go to the to the bar and drink with him. Maybe now we can go fishing with him. Right? So they keep asking these questions. They want to know what happened to you. What happened to you? What happened to you? How are you? How can you see? How can you see? So it's this realization that something, watch, physical has happened to him that now makes available some other social realities. Okay. Here's a social reality that they have to come to terms with beyond just this physical healing, the social reality is that they asked the pivotal question. He said, the man called Jesus made mud. That's what happened to me. He told me to go wash the salon. I washed and I came back healed or came back seeing. The social transition takes place here because he begins to have opportunity to share with them something that Jesus did for him. I don't know what they know about Jesus. I don't know if they've seen Jesus work before. I don't know if they've had opportunity to hear from other people about what Jesus has done. In fact, if you read through the story again, you'll recognize that he all he knows is that this man's name is Jesus. He doesn't know necessarily who Jesus is. Right. He certainly can't point him out in the crowd because he hadn't seen him. But here he has a chance to tell the story. And it's the telling of the story based on his new physical reality that permits an opportunity for a new social reality. A new social transition is taking place. And it's taking place so much so that when they recognize his healing and how he prescribes it to Jesus, they in turn bring him to the Pharisees. I want you to see God working here. God is not just working to heal this man, although he's done it through Jesus. But God is also working to change the minds of the people who see this man's healing. Their process is, again, as I mentioned, to take him, take him to the temple. Uh, they're supposed to take him to the priest. That's problem number one, so they can 
recognize that he has, in fact, been healed. But they take him to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees start asking other questions. And again, it's this notion of social transition, because note how even among the Pharisees, there is some division about the ability of Jesus based on this man's physical transition. Listen to what they said. He testifies again. He put mud on my eyes. I wash. Now I see. Verse 16. Some of the Pharisees said, this man, Jesus, is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. Okay, this healing took place on the Sabbath, and they claim that since Jesus killed him on the Sabbath, he must not observe the Sabbath. But there are others among the Pharisees who said, how can a man who's a sinner perform such signs? Note the division that's beginning to take place here, and the text says they were divided. Even among the Pharisees, there's a social realization, or a realization rather, that their social, social construct, the way they form their social circles, is also subject to observation and subject to change. That's what happens when, you, when Jesus gets involved. Jesus makes you question what has happened to you, to other people, and then makes you question whether or not these ideas you have been holding are the right ones to hold. Jesus has a way of forcing us to open our hands at times to receive new revelation. Jesus has a way of forcing us to confront our preconceived notions, our presuppositions, and then, and then, this is this is what I called earlier the opportunities that God gives us, and then to accept the opportunity from God to walk through a different door. Even among the Pharisees, this becomes part of their social reality, and it has a lot to do with this man's physical transition. Okay. So uh, in the interest of time, we're getting getting to the end. Again, you can kind of carry this out. And as you read through uh, the 34 verses that we've shared together, uh, I want you to kind of do what, what we have done up to this point through verse, um, through verse 17. Just carry that on for the rest of the text. And you can see what are the social implications around this man's physical healing. Okay. What are the social implications around this physical healing? All right, so that's the first block on the top of page two on your handout. So again, well, just make your notes as you go. Yes, go ahead. A Question. comment, uh, comment? based on, okay. on what you were just saying about uh, like preconceived notions. I had written down something that I saw this morning. You know, I love quotes. But it said, your assumptions are your windows on the world. Scrub them off every once in a while or the light won't come in. That's kind of what you just said. Every once in a while, you got to scrub. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Kinda... It's, it's like it's that spring cleaning notion or fall cleaning, however you want to situate it. Yeah, every once in a while, just, you know, it's okay to ask the questions. Is this really what I should be thinking? Is this really where I should be? You know, I've seen I've seen the healing take place. So what is that? How does that or what is the implication for the way I view God and what God is able to do? And what God desires for me to do? These are the opportunities that come to us. All right. So let's let's go down the middle of the page, uh, page two. You'll see there strategies for joyful physical and social transitions because as you know sometimes it can be difficult to manage the seasons of change and transition as it relates to our physical changes and our social changes because physically we may lose the uh, energy and zeal that we had we may lose even the ability to do uh, and you can just think of how long it might take you to go upstairs now versus how long it used to take you and whether or not you even want to go up the stairs now <laughs> or not. So there are ways to there are ways to think through that. And then socially, that you know, transitioning means social transitions sometimes mean that the the friends and the family and the close associates that we used to hang with a lot are are no longer with us, either by virtue of 
a decision that we've made either mutually or you made it yourself, or they just, you know, they've gone on. Uh, they, they passed and, and they're just no longer with us. So we transition in a number of ways. How can we do it joyfully? I think this text offers to us a few ideas. These four that I've mentioned on, on the page um, are here for your consideration uh, as we go. So the question is, how can I joyfully navigate the seasons of life when I experience physical and social transitions? First, and again, it's kind of coming from the text that we've read, recognize that Jesus can use physical conditions and social locations to glorify God. Jesus can use physical conditions and social locations to glorify God. You've already, we've read it already. You've heard it a couple of times. Jesus says to his disciples, the reason why this man is born blind is not because he has sinned nor his parents. That's not why. He's born blind because God is going to be glorified through him. As soon as I get done with him, you, you will see it. You're going to see it. It's the miracle for physical sight is also the miracle for social transition that I want us to pay attention to here again because note the people who the neighbors and other people who saw him begging know socially something's different about him he's now in a different location the Pharisees begin to dispute among themselves about who Jesus is based on this man's physical condition no they are they have to call into question their social location Pay attention to the idea that his parents are under threat and they want to entrap them uh, and, to, and say, listen, yeah, we, Jesus did it. But they know what the Pharisees will do to them and they don't want to damage their social location. So they say, go ask him. But he is unafraid because his social location before Jesus. And this this, this is a note for somebody who, who identifies with this man by more than just his physical blindness. His, their social, his social location before he met Jesus is far different than his social location after he met Jesus, right? Isn't that, isn't that the story with us and our spiritual lives and a condition of our souls? Thank God, somewhere along the way, Jesus got involved with us, okay? So recognize that Jesus can use physical conditions and social locations to glorify God. And when we do that, that's one way we can be joyful about the seasons uh, transition in our lives. Second, believe that some transitions are miracles that can point people to Jesus. These things are miracles. Some of these transitions that we undertake are miracles. And we ought to thank God for them because they give us opportunities to say, oh, Jesus helped me to get through that. Now, Jesus, Jesus kept me in my period of bereavement. It was my faith in God that held me uh, when, you know, I lost my leg or I had to have some limbs amputated. It was my connection to Jesus and the miracle of life, the miracle that I can still reach for hope, the miracle that I'm still waking up in the morning, able to be grateful for this new day, despite my physical realities. And you can point people to Jesus with these transitions. Uh, we, we should be doing that. The next thing is to be courageous. That's the next strategy. Be courageous. Because you are the evidence that you need in order to demonstrate that God is still at work. But can you picture what happens if this man, having received his sight, goes home, never to be seen from again? Instead, he makes himself available. He goes out in public. He stays outside, if you will. His neighbors see him. They ask him questions. He's up for the task. They take him to the Pharisees. They see him. They ask him questions. He's up for the task. They call him back in after they've had time with his parents. He Answers the questions, responds, he's up for the task. He's courageous because he's willing to demonstrate a power that is greater than the powers in this world. God is still at work. Finally, as far as the strategies are concerned, be grateful. Be grateful. Uh, because some people 
and some places are detrimental to the new us. What do I mean by that? Look in your Bibles at verse 34. They answer him, you were born entirely in sins. And are you trying to teach us? That's what they said to him. And then they drove him out. They drove him out. I said, be grateful <laughs> because some people and places are detrimental to the new us. This man, um, not only do they not want him in there, they are not worthy of him in there. Listen to how they try to separate the, and make him less than. He was born entirely in sins as if they weren't born entirely in sins. He just got healed by Jesus. They still need to be touched by Jesus. He is walking in newness and new opportunities, fresh life. He's got, a, he's got an opportunity to experience the blessings of God. They've had all of this and they are still blind. So not only do they not want him there, maybe the good news for him is he doesn't even fit in there anymore. Okay, so sometimes we need to learn to be grateful and praise God that we don't fit. And then sometimes people look at us different. It's okay. Be glad about that. Be glad about that. You, you know, you don't... <laughs> You don't want to agitate folks, I don't think, you know, or be, you know, up, you know, uh, blatantly disrespectful to folks. But I think it's OK just to say, hey, listen, y'all do you. That's not me. I'm on a different page in my life now. I'm walking this way with Jesus. And be glad about it. Be glad about it. All right, I've got a few more points to make before we end our time here. But uh, what do you think? Any comments, questions? How do you how do you respond to that? I just want to say, coming from a Catholic background, I'm talking about Catholic school, the nuns, the priests, the whole works. So when the Lord brought me, I, I have a book that's in me that I have to get on the pages. It's from religion to relationship. That's mm. going to be the name of it. From religion to relationship. And we're talking about grandparents, not my grandmother. My grandmother was a good Baptist lady, but when you marry a Catholic, you have to raise the children as Catholic. And so that means my mother was Catholic. But when the Lord brought me out of Catholicism into a relationship with Jesus Christ, they think you're crazy. I mean, they go down the list, your grandfather Catholic, this aunt and uncle, you know, I say, but there's a difference between a relationship with Jesus Christ and religion. And so that transformation was really great for me, <laughs> really great. But because I would say to any believer or anybody, you have to know the voice of the Lord for yourself so that you can walk with him in the cool of the day. Because you got to know, but you know who called you, who saved you, and what he called you to do with the call on your life and the gifts that go with that call. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate you sharing that. That's exactly what is is exactly what it is. Yes. Oh, you oh. Pass, you you have another reformed Catholic at Word for Life, and they expressed um, a lot of learning and um, connection because uh, I don't uh, this these are my words, so take them like that. I don't know that the Catholic faith teaches, th does things like Bible study, teaching the Bible and the word that's in the Bible. There's, there's something else that goes on. Um, and, and the learning of, of what's in the Bible is the words in the Bible are not really uh, something that's, really pushed in the Catholic religion. All right. 
All right. Well, we praise God for the word of God and the ability to read it for ourselves yes. and pray to God for understanding and instruction from the spirit and uh, the ability to walk in it. Amen. So we praise God for it. Yes. All right. So before we go, um, end of the page, down at the bottom of page two, some God honoring ways to manage physical and social transitions. Um, I think some of that you may have picked up along the way. Um, again, just being open to the idea that God can work through these transitions, through the need for change. God can work through the need for change to promote the transition that comes uh, for us and prayerfully we receive them as opportunities from God. So what are some other perhaps principles and precepts that exist that can help us navigate and manage the physical and social transitions that are certainly a part of life? Uh, there are some texts here. Uh, Psalm 37, verse 25 is one. Um, I used to have it up in front of me, but I don't anymore. Psalm 37, verse 25 says something like this. Hold on. I have been young. Thank you. And now I'm old. Uh, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor their children, nor their seed begging um, for bread. Yeah. All right. This is not an absolute statement to suggest that the psalmist had never seen righteous people struggling and righteous children begging for bread. That's not that's not what the psalmist is saying. The psalmist is saying, if you look over the course of one's life, even when it doesn't look good, God it remains faithful. That's the message here. God is faithful for the duration of life. Because we know sometimes it doesn't look good. We know a lot of times it may not feel good, but we also know that God is good. Proverbs 17, verse 22, another way is to locate reasons to celebrate and be happy. Here's what the text says. A cheerful heart is a good medicine, but a downcast spirit dries up the bones. Sometimes you got to reach for cheer, find a reason to celebrate. If you can't find a reason to celebrate of your own, link up with somebody else and find a reason to celebrate with them. Somebody be glad in the room. Celebrate, right? Find a reason to celebrate and be happy. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through 2. Um, do not neglect your physical health. And I know this text is not pointing in that direction, but I think there's a principle or at least a precept that we can lift out of here. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Do not neglect your physical health, just like you ought to not neglect your spiritual health, because your body is the very temple of God and is to be holy unto God. And in the same way, verse two is saying, essentially train your brain and your body to be in sync with one another in accordance with, the, with a healthy spirit. That's one way to navigate physical and social transitions. And then finally, Philippians chapter four, uh, verse six through nine. Think positively. Think positively. So train your brain. <laughs> train your brain to counter the attacks of the enemy and negativity. Because here's the truth. The enemy will come after your mind. Because your mind is often the way to get to your spirit. And when you get to your spirit, you're right next door to your soul. Train your brain that when you think about what's happening around the world, you don't have to mentally check out, but find a reason to keep rejoicing. Verse four, uh, chapter four in Philippians, 
says in verse six, do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, will, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence and if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about them. Train your brain to think positively. And then verse 9 says, keep on doing the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you. To help us, I add on to this, to manage physical and social transitions because they come for us all. And we have to not only anticipate their coming, but learn to welcome their coming as opportunities for God to work. And as God is working, then we celebrate what God is doing. Um, any questions, comments, concerns?